Hey there! So it's Mr. Oliver talking to y'all and today we're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution. Please notice how cool this is. The Industrial Revolution isn't boring y'all. The Industrial Revolution is hyphy. Alright, speaking of hyphy, look at this gentleman right here. You got the Industrial Revolution beginning in England around 1780. Now clarification. It's not like a magic banner comes down from the heavens and proclaims the Industrial Revolution has begun. Uh, it's just that we say about 1780. These, some of these things were invented prior to this, and there were certainly more innovations after 1780. But we say 1780 just because it's kind of convenient. Now, we say it reaches the continent after 1815. And you're probably thinking, um, what about uh, 1815 is significant to me? Um, OMG, is that a reference to Napoleon? And I would say absolutely. 1815 is the Battle of Waterloo, the defeat of Napoleon, and the Congress of Vienna is able to finish their work. In other words, the Napoleonic era is pretty much over, which means the continent can kind of settle down from all the wars and stuff they were doing. So it gives them a chance to kind of, you know, reload. And England had an advantage. They had multiple years of advantage over them. So why are they first? Well, let's think about it. Well, as you remember from the past, uh, Britain had made huge gains in agriculture. Uh, they were at the forefront of the agricultural revolution. But you say, um, actually the Dutch were. Yeah, but the Brit British uh, followed quickly thereafter. And because of these gains in agriculture, they were definitely able to turn that into profit. Because having a surplus of agriculture also means that you're going to be able to get rid of the extras because you know it's enough to feed everybody and then what sell them to somebody else son so there's that also the Dutch had a number of financial innovations that they kind of brought with them when William became the King of England after 1688 and that included uh, paper money a central bank uh, a emphasis on the government kind of staying out of things, uh, credit, the idea of extending credit, all of those things really help. And if you recall, after the agricultural revolution and specifically the, the enclosure movement, we had seen a lot of people uh, not have jobs. So the labor pool is uh, going to be hurt as well. Government largely stayed out of business. I already said that. And Britain had many different markets to sell to as well. In fact, it was said that the British Empire was so expansive all over the world that the sun never set on the British Empire. And if you look at it, no matter where the sun is, somewhere it is daytime. Look at everything in red there. Australia! We got India. Uh, we haven't really gotten to the stuff in Africa yet. That's uh, the chapter on imperialism, so I'm cheating a little bit here. Of course, here's Great Britain. Oh, Canada. And we got the South Pacific. Tons of stuff. So they got all kinds of people to sell things to. Um, I just wanted to mention this because I don't know about other teachers, but I personally like to talk about canals. Uh, canals are super important early on in Britain because they allow people to transport merchants, to transport things from factories to cities. Uh, early on, before railroads, they were very important. But what, where were they making these things? Well, let me tell you. Cotton spinning is made in factories. There were new inventions. Uh, there was the spinning jenny by James Hargreaves. Uh, spinning jenny named after James Hargreaves' uh, daughter. I'm not sure why he named his daughter spinning. Uh, you also had a water frame by Richard Arkwright, and this utilized water power to actually cause this big old wheel to spin. And here, I'll draw it. And it's um, pointer options. Pin. Okay, so you had water, 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 and then you had this wheel. 
it didn't actually look a ton like this. And the water caused it to turn. And the wheel is attached to this shaft thing that went into the factory and was hooked up to all these different machines. And so when this turned, it would cause the shaft to turn, which would in turn cause all of the machines to work all at once. Pretty snazzy, eh? 18th century. Y'all, pretty dope. And uh, this was necessary to have in the country because not a lot of uh, running rivers in the middle of uh, big cities for the most part. Uh, what did this lead to? Well, you had fabric being created a lot more easily as a result of these things. And uh, as a result, you had better wages for weavers. And McKay, our textbook, talks about underwear because McKay is kind of a weird guy. And he just kind of randomly says, like, that meant more people could have undergarments. And I thought it was so weird that it was worth sharing. Uh, but it's true. Not many people had, um, like, underwear or even many choices as far as clothing went. So it's a pretty, pretty, pretty big deal. Of course, once the steam engine comes along, um, it's not a huge game changer immediately, but a guy, because it had been invented by Savory and Newcomb, uh, kind of independently of each other, but a guy named James Watt comes along and says, you know what, I bet I could make this better. So he does. He revolutionizes the way that power is, is made and, and the way that uh, factories work. They're no longer dependent on water power now because they can use the steam engine for power. So they're able to move their factories to the city, which cuts down on transportation costs quite a bit. So really, I guess factories becoming more successful, we should all turn down for what? Turn down for what? Get it? Also, we've got the first railroad being invented in 1830. Uh, it's, it's called the rocket, and I've actually had students ask me, like, um, Mr. Oliver, is that, like, sarcastic? No, it is not sarcastic, uh, but certainly their, their idea of a racing uh, railroad is a bit different than we would consider to be something that goes very fast. If it went 30 miles per hour, they were like, whoa, that is booking it, man. Whereas nowadays, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a slow person in the right lane. I was going to say an elderly person. I don't want to offend any of my elderly students. What did this mean? Well, let me tell you something. Uh, journey times from London were much quicker. Uh, getting to Edinburgh, Scotland, was much faster. Look at that. By wagon, look at this dude. He's like, I'm very sad in regards to how long this is taking. Actually, probably the guy that's being transported is in there. There he is. Let's draw him. Um, he's probably like, I'm very sad. He's probably got a fancy hat. Um, he is not happy about how long it's taken. Boom. Twelve and a quarter. And at first, they weren't even thinking about taking people. They were just like, hey, we can get stuff to places faster. That's cool. But then eventually, something unexpected happened, and people started being like, oh, we'd like to get a ride. People were like, what? Why, why do you, this is for stuff. This is for cargo. Okay, cargo, not you go. But people are like, no, 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 we totes want to go. And the railroad then, they get clever about it, and they start having passenger cars and cargo cars. And so, as you could see, really cuts things down, which is good, because back in the day, people tended to live their whole lives within like 20, 30 miles of one location. So, you know, after a hundred years or a couple of hundred years, the gene pool gets a little bit shallow, if you know what I mean, because you're always marrying somebody who's like your cousin and whatnot. This is good for people who are not into cousin marriage, because then you can go, oh, hey, I'm going to go to Edinburgh and marry some Scottish girl. Or maybe just date. Probably just start with dating. Don't, just don't jump into the, into the marriage, kids. What were working conditions like? Well, early on, when they were in factory, or factories were off in the country, 
Uh, often, they were staffed by orphan children. They emptied out the orphanages and actually put these kids in, as young as five years old, and basically had them work for, work. I mean, they worked them hard, too, and they had them work to the bone to get this stuff done. And um, you're like, well, that's not nice. No, it's not. It's really not. But that's what they did. Uh, and kids had dangerous jobs. Um, it could just be working something, but they have to work 14 to 16 hours at some times. And so they were whipped if they started falling asleep. There was no playtime. Bathroom breaks are limited. When you think factories from the 18th century, think of what we now call sweatshops in other parts of the world. And they're really bad, terrible conditions. And kids were also used because they were small. So it was like, oh, hey, that thing's stuck over there, that machine. Maybe you can get in there because you're little. And like, oh, okay, there, governor, I guess I can't. Because they're British, you know. And they're getting in there like, oh, I, I unclogged it. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I just unplugged it. And there's no safety rules. So sometimes people were careless. Boom, I lost my arm. And then what now? I can't work no more. My arm's missing. I don't have no arm. And they're all like, you're fired, Timmy. And they're like, what are you talking about? I lost my arm at work. Like, well, there's nothing called workers' comp just yet because we don't, it's not until later in the 19th century when you get that. So ha ha ha, little, little Timmy, you get out of my factory. Now, this is not to say that it was only England that was industrializing. After the French Revolution, everybody catches up. Uh, first France, and then Germany, especially once it industrializes, I'm sorry, once it unifies uh, by about 1871, uh, Germany is on point with industrialization, and they catch up real, real fast. Uh, the old style of work was the cottage industry, where people have been making textiles at home with like a spinning wheel. And families were all working together and everybody had a job, men and women working together. That was all dead. Uh, so when the factory started up, many families actually moved to the factories together and worked together. And families liked it that way. They were like, you know, if little Timmy's working, I won't be able to see him. But as the years went on, it separated families and it was rough. Um, people started complaining. For one reason they were complaining, not just because it's wrong to make little kids work, but because they were like, um, those kids are coming in and taking my jobs. That's right. Adults were upset about children working, not just because of the morality of it, but because jobs were being taken by children, and you could pay a kid less than an adult. So a lot of factories were like, well, yeah, we want it to get the job done and also be able to pay people less, so win-win. Uh, so later on, uh, you end up with rules against that. Um, like I said, uh, early on the factories had orphans. That changes by 1802. And like I said on the other slide, uh, factories began to go to work together. Um, married women from the working classes often would retire temporarily from the workforce once they had their first child. Uh, partially because they had no job advancement, they were paid poorly, uh, a woman doing similar work to a man would be paid less uh, significantly, and that was actually on the pay scales as far as what they were allowed. Uh, of course, all this early factory stuff caused a lot of pollution. Uh, this is workers' housing in Manchester and the factories and all that. Here's the overall city view. Here's the workers' housing. Notice again the cool stuff, kids. This isn't boring. It's very exciting. Uh, Charles Dickens, uh, he's the guy that wrote Scrooge. It's called A Christmas uh, Carol. And um, he describes uh, this um, fictional city as being a town of red brick or of brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. I mean, just got this layer of grime on it. It was a town of machinery and time, uh, tall chimneys out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever. It had a black canal in it and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye and vast piles of buildings full of windows where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long. All the public inscriptions in the town were painted alike in severe characters of black and white. 
The jail might have been in Fermanagh. Fermanagh might have been the jail. I got a little Scottish towards the end of that. I apologize. But what he's saying is, this is an ugly place. It's got heck of pollution. Okay? So, don't go back in time to that time. It's going to be ugly. Uh, this compare stuff, I kind of like it visually how it works. Um, early on, it compares a bunch of different stuff. You got the railroad, like how many square miles of railroad there were, um, how much coal production, steam power, uh, how much pig iron, iron they're making. Pig iron is like a cheaper form of iron. How much raw cotton they're producing or utilizing. And notice, Germany is heck of catching up there as far as railroads go. But um, in coal production, they're quite a bit. And you go like, well, what, weren't they making stuff? Well, you got to figure the coal, the more coal they have, the more stuff they're using, the more heat they're, they're creating, which means that they're using more stuff for their factories. So they need that in order to make the factories work. So the higher these numbers are, uh, the better, basically. Um, Later on in the century, you get a movement against child labor led by Robert Owen, who is a bit of a socialist. And um, he, along with others, uh, managed to bring attention to this in something called the Sadler Commission, which uh, we will read about in class and bring some attention to child labor. It's rough stuff. It's kind of sad. Uh, basically, it's as bad as I said before, but you actually get to hear little kids talk about it, so it's really depressing. Um, Parliament does respond eventually with some legislation. 1833, the factory workday is limited. Uh, 1842, no more mine work for boys under 10. No women in mines. You gotta keep in mind if they're getting coal, they gotta be getting it from somewhere, right? So that's from these mines, and they're having to uh, push it out from these tiny little tunnels. And there's lots of cave-ins. Uh, sometimes there's gas that kills people. Uh, there's worries about decency for women because often people are like, you know, overheated down there, so they're removing clothing. It was a big problem. I'm going to pause there and, and make this into a second part. So, see you all later. Bye bye.